All right, thank you, Kevin, and uh, thanks for also giving me the chance to speak here at this very impressive institute. I just got a tour. It's really a, a very nice place to be here, and it's quite unique to have this connection of going from quantum all the way to, to devices and applications. That's a, a really impressive place. So uh, thank you for giving me the chance to speak here. So I'll talk about uh, solar cells, but before, before I start, a bit more background about where I'm from or where, where I work. So I work at AMOF, which is the uh, Dutch Institute for Fundamental Science on uh, the physics of complex functional matter. So it's a bit of a mouthful, um, and I'll, I'll show you a bit more uh, in the next slide. But we're based in, in the beautiful city of Amsterdam uh, with lots of small canals and everything. And we have this institute, which is a bit like a Max Planck Institute. So we do uh, fundamental research. We are fairly small, about 200 scientists, uh, and we focus on, on four different uh, research themes. Um, and they're nanophotonics, uh, biophysics, designer matter, and photovoltaics. And I'm, of course, in the photovoltaic scheme, but the idea is to also have a lot of interaction between the different uh, themes, maybe uh, very much like, like in this place here. And of course, in photovoltaics, we have a lot of interaction with nanophotonics because uh, understanding light on the nanoscale has uh, strong implications for solar cells as well. So um, to, uh, to start, I would like to, to uh, introduce my view on, on the solar revolution that we are about to, to go through. Because if you think about the electrical grid that we're using to, uh, to, um, for, for our power generation, um, it's basically, uh, a bit like a wire grid, right? You start with very thick wires at the point where power is generated, and then they, they, they go into thinner and thinner wires all the way to our homes where we use the electrical power. And for the last 200 years, we only have uh, generated electrical power in, in one single way, and that is by taking a magnet and then rubbing that magnet along the wire to generate potential and driving current through the wire. And that really has been the same since the invention of uh, uh, the electric disk generator by Michael Faraday. I think it was in uh, 1831 or so. Um, and since ever, ever since then, we've generated the bulk of our electrical power using magnets uh, rubbing some uh, past wires. And it doesn't matter if you think about uh, coal power plants, uh, gas power plants, nuclear power plants, um, uh, hydropower, wind power, and even solar thermal, they all do the same thing. They all just rub magnets past wires. Now, with solar cells, for the first time, we do something very different. We take some scissors, we cut the wires apart, and already you can see a bit of a band gap developing here. Right? So now you can shine light on your band gap and you generate uh, potential by exciting electrons up to the conduction band and thereby uh, generating electrical power. So it's a revolution in the way we make electricity and it's a revolution that I'm convinced is actually going to happen. And one of my, my favorite ways to show that it is going to happen is this graph, which was uh, published in this uh, recent science review, where um, they compare the, the installed photovoltaic capacity to the expectations from the International Energy Agency. And for example, if you look at the expectation from 2002, what they were expecting the solar to grow, but you know, much slower than it did. So it's, it's orders of magnitude off by now. And even the prediction from two years ago is you know, already far outdated. So we constantly and consistently underestimate how quickly photovoltaic uh, installations grow. So that's really a, a revolution uh, that is going to happen. But solar cells do have uh, a problem, and that, is, uh, that will illustrate with this toy model of a solar cell. So solar cells are basically machines that uh, convert photon, photon energy into electrical energy. Right? So you, you put photons in and electrons out. And they're made from semiconductors, so they're two-state systems with a valence band that's full of electrons and a conduction band that's empty of electrons and some kind of conversion mechanism between the two bands, uh, which I illustrate here by this conveyor belt. So if you then shine a photon onto your solar cell, um, you can absorb the photon and use the energy of that photon to excite an electron to the conduction band. And that's all well and good. Now the problem uh, for solar cells is that the solar spectrum is a very broadband source of light. Right? You have white light, which means it consists of all kinds of different photon energies, very high energy photons and very low energy photons. So if you now shine a high energy photon onto our solar cell, it will still be absorbed and it excites an electron, but it excites it all the way up to a very high lying state in the conduction band, and then it drops down to the conduction band edge. So all the excess energy is lost as heat. Conversely, if you use a low energy photon, it will just transmit through the semiconductor because there's not enough energy to excite an electron. So um, all, all that energy is also lost as heat, as, as lost uh, by transmission. So those two losses together are the main reason for what we call the shockley quasar limit for the efficiency of solar cells, which is about 33%. So it's, we plot here the shockley quasar limit um, for, for solar cells of different band gaps. And you can see it depends on the band gap, but it peaks somewhere at around 33%. So then we compare the, the current solar cell technologies, um, the most important ones, to the shockley quasar limit. So we take the record efficiency solar cell and sort of compare it 
And you can see that especially gallium arsenide and silicon are already very close to their efficiency limit. And what this means is that uh, they will maybe increase in efficiency a little bit, but we won't get a very a strong efficiency increase in the future from any of the established technologies because they're already so close to the thermodynamic limit. By the way, I find it quite amazing that we can make something that's so close to its limit. So silicon cells are really um, extremely highly optimized uh, devices. And it's, it's really, if you look at it closely, it's really impressive how well they actually work. But yeah, so to, to, to go to higher efficiency, we have to do something that's really fundamentally very different. And so today I'll show you two ways how we could do this. Uh, the first one, I'll talk about the perovskite work that we're doing. So perovskites um, are recent hype materials in solar cell research, which could uh, lead to more efficient solar cells in a sort of tandem solar cell configuration. And I'll talk a bit about, about these organic materials, which can be used as down converters, converting high energy photons into lower energy excited states and thereby increasing the solar cell efficiency. So I'll first start with the perovskite work that we're doing. So in perovskites, you could go to high efficiency solar cells by um, essentially uh, you are working with two conveyor belts. Right? So, the, so they have uh, one um, high energy, uh, semi, or high band gap semiconductor and one low band gap semiconductor and you stack them and then the total potential of your solar cell is going to be the sum of the two. So um, in this case, uh, the, the, uh, I think there's going to be, yeah, there's a photon coming in. So you have a high energy photon exciting an electron across the high band gap semiconductor and then the electron travels into the other semiconductor and gets excited again, uh, which then uh, gives you a total potential that's much higher than the, the, um, the potential of the single cell. So you avoid some of the losses from the high energy photons because you catch them in the high band gap semiconductor. Now, silicon is an excellent choice for the low band gap semiconductor because silicon is really cheap these days. It's very well established. And there's huge factories for silicon. It's highly optimized. So the question is then, what do you use for the uh, high band gap semiconductor? And so far, people have mainly used uh, uh, things like uh, gallium arsenide and indium gallium arsenide because yeah, they work very well. I mean, the, the latest efficiency records of, uh, of uh, gallium arsenide or indium gallium arsenide on silicon is, I think, about 33%, which is just above the shock equalizer limit for, for silicon. Um, the problem is that they're also very expensive to make. Right? Um, and recently, uh, we've, uh, uh, there's been um, a new material in the solar cell research field called the perovskite, and they could solve this or could fill this gap. So perovskite is basically just a crystal structure, uh, but in particular, these metal halide perovskites where this, this atom here in the middle is a lead atom, and then these atoms around here could be iodide or, or, or bromide, and then in the middle here, you've got a cut iron, which could be organic or inorganic. Those metal halide uh, perovskites have really uh, taken up the solar cell field by storm. So uh, we plot the same data here as before from all the different materials, but now as a function of the increase in power conversion efficiency per year. So you can see silicon here doesn't increase very much anymore because it already is very efficient. But perovskites are really uh, all the way up here, and we have to break the scale, otherwise it would be completely off the chart. Right? There's almost 3% efficiency increase per year, which is completely unseen of in the history of solar cell uh, development. So it's an incredible increase in efficiency, which is why they've caused enormous attention. I mean, now there are thousands of groups in the world working on perovskites. I think this year we get about 4,000 papers on perovskite solar cells. So it's an absolutely crazy field. But there are still a few things that we don't really understand about these perovskites. So one of them is, is how does their structure relate to their properties? And in particular, one, one, one mystery that we looked at is why do they absorb light so strongly, but at the same time have a, a long charge carrier lifetime? And that uh, is uh, apparently a contradiction. If you look at two of the most popular semiconductors, gallium arsenide and silicon, you'll find that gallium arsenide has a very strong absorption coefficient um, because it's a direct band gap semiconductor. But silicon has a much weaker absorption coefficient because it's an indirect band gap semiconductor, meaning you need a f a momentum to absorb a photon. On the contrary, the lifetime in gallium arsenide is much, much faster than in silicon. Now, if you look at perovskites, they're a bit of an odd one out. So the, the absorption is as strong as in gallium arsenide but then the lifetime is much longer. That has been puzzling people for quite a long time. So the first uh, hints as to why or where this could come from came from a uh, theory. So when people calculate the band structure of perovskites, um, you get these, these diagrams. And what, what's, what's uh, uh, particular about these diagrams is that you get this peculiar splitting of the conduction band. Right? It splits into two separate bands. And that's a splitting that is sort of well known in semiconductor uh, physics. Uh, it's called Rashbaugh splitting. And it arises if you have a heavy atom and, and some asymmetry around this atom. So you, you know, in this case, it's a lead atom. And somehow, the, the crystal must be asymmetric around the lead atom. And then you can get these, these uh, rush plus splitting. Now, 
how could this cause the, the, the charge carriers to recombine slowly? Well, let's look at the, uh, the band structure in details. If we, if we absorb light, we can still absorb it via this direct transition here. And then charges could thermalize into these indirect pockets. And then for recombination, they would need a pho phonon momentum. So they have to interact with the phonon for recombination. So sort of protected from recombination in those pockets. And from this difference in energy between the two states, it's predicted that the recombination should be slowed down by a factor of 300 or so. So it could be quite a significant effect on the, the carrier lifetime. Now the question is, you know, why has nobody seen this so far? Because it's been already uh, predicted in 2014, and in perovskite worlds, that's a long, a long, long time ago. Right? So why has nobody seen this? So I think my view on this, at least, is that um, they're, they're quite dark states, right? So we do, that means the absorption and the emission from those states is relatively weak. They also are very close to the band edge, and the recombination is slow. So it does look very much like like a trap state or an exotonic state. Right? So people have always assigned these signatures to trap states. So we set out to do pressure experiments where you use uh, hydrostatic pressure to reduce the asymmetry of the crystal. If you get less, less volume where the crystal can range into, it has to uh, confine to a more symmetric configuration. It doesn't, however, change the trap state density, for example, because that's more of a material property, not so much a structural property. OK, so we've done an experiment under pressure. So here's our pressure experiments. Uh, here's our pressure cell. It's, we put the perovskites in there inside a hydraulic liquid. And then we have our captain, Benjamin, who turns the, the big wheel to pump uh, simply more liquid into the chamber and thereby increasing the pressure. Very uh, low-tech experiment, but it, uh, we can then do all kinds of optical experiments to study how the perovskite changes under pressure. Before we look at the signatures of the indirect band gap, we first look at the direct band gap change under pressure. So what we see there is that the band gap, simply from the absorption spectrum, first uh, redshifts, then there's a phase transition, and then it blue shifts again. So we can reproduce this redshift from, a, from a DFT calculations. We don't uh, allow for the atoms to reconfigure, so we can't uh, reproduce the phase shift, but OK, that, that's fine. Um, and what's also to notice is that it's completely elastic. So pressure up and pressure down give us exactly the same shifts. So it's an elastic change of the crystal structure. OK, so now we can go to the uh, signature of the indirect band gap. So here's our picture. right? If we have this indirect band gap, we think under pressure we could reduce the splitting because we're reducing the asymmetry of the crystal. So let's look first at zero pressure. Uh, the photoluminescence spectrum at zero pressure is usually comprised of these two peaks, the one big peak, and then red of this, a slightly smaller peak. And quite often, people assign this peak to trap states, but there's not actually that much uh, um, uh, said about this, this side peak. So if we then apply pressure, we can see the shift of the main peak. This is the band gap shift. We can also see that the side peak becomes more pronounced. And if we compare the difference in energy between the main and the side peak, it decreases. So that's consistent with the picture that we're decreasing the splitting and hence decreasing this energy difference between the two states, and also that we need less phonon momentum, so the absolute intensity goes up. A second uh, piece of evidence is the um, photoluminescence lifetime. Oh, I should also say, at, at, at very high pressures, we only see one peak, and that's after the phase transition. We think that's completely direct band gap semiconductor afterwards. So I said the indirect band gap would slow down recombination. So that means if we reduce the indirect band gap, we should see faster recombination. So we look at the photoluminescence lifetime, which is a signature of the recombination of charges. And you can see at zero pressure, it's slow. And at higher pressures, it's, it, it's faster. So that's all well and good. But we can also quantify this a bit more. So we take a model. where We model the decay of charges. So the, the, the change in, in the uh, charge carry density uh, could be either monomolecular, so it depends on only the charge carry density, or bimolecular, so it depends on, on two charges. And for perovskites, we know that bimolecular decay is mostly radiative, so emit photons. A monomolecular, so mostly non-radiative, uh, trap-assisted recombination. So then we can model this decay curve, and the, fit, the curves fit very nicely. Uh, and we can extract how many of the charges decay radiatively and how many decay non-radiatively. And you can see under pressure, the fraction of charges decaying radiatively uh, roughly doubles, uh, which is, again, consistent with the picture that you have a more direct band gap semiconductor, so it needs less phonon momentum for recombination, which makes it more likely to decay radiatively. So then the final piece of evidence is that if you emit from the state here, you should also be able to absorb into the state just from reciprocity uh, um, of these uh, uh, transitions. So we look at um, data from literature. We took a very accurate absorption measurement from literature. Uh, they're called uh, PDS measurements, or photothermal deflection spectroscopy measurements, where you measure the band gap or the absorption very far below the band gap. So many orders of magnitude lower than the absorption edge of the semiconductor. And what we find is that uh, you cannot really fit the absorption edge with just a direct band gap semiconductor. So if we try this, uh, the best fit that we get is this dashed line here. And you can see, especially 
just below the band gap, it really doesn't fit very well. Only if you also include an indirect band gap, only then we can fit the absorption edge of these perovskites. What's more, the difference in energy between the indirect and direct band gap perfectly matches the difference in energy in the PL spectrum where we saw the both two peaks, and it also matches the predictions from theory. So the picture that arises is that um, these perovskites um, at zero pressure show this direct-indirect combination where you have a direct transition and an indirect transition, and they both play a role for the photophysics. And at high pressure, it's completely direct. It's, more, it's got a higher radiative rate and a higher radiative efficiency. Of course, since uh, we've, we've worked on this, other people also worked in this very big field, so we're not the only ones. And uh, I should show a few examples. So here is a measurement from our colleagues at Delft, which came out almost simultaneously with our measurements, where they measure um, the, the two states, or the difference in the two states with microwave connectivity measurements, and they find a very similar energy difference between the two states. There's some very elegant experiments where people used circularly polarized light to only excite one of the two electron spins into the two sidebands, and they see that the the photocurrent that generate changes depending on which spin state they inject into. And then finally, the same group uh, did ARPES measurements, which basically maps out the valence band on a different semiconductor. So this is the bromide equivalent. So we did the same on the iodide, triiodide. This is the bromide. Um, but there, they see a strong splitting in the valence band. So there is evidence, or the evidence is growing, I should say, that this indirect uh, band gap is uh, existent in perovskites uh, and that it plays a role uh, for the photophysics. So the last thing I would like to say about this is that uh, we would like to know how much does it matter for solar cells. Um, before I say that, I should also say that it's probably not the only thing that, that plays a role near the band edge. There are probably also shallow traps that play a role. There's also excitons and even polarons that, that are important. So we have to understand all of these to really understand how these perovskites work and why they're so efficient. So solar cells, well, does it play a role for solar cells? And I, I'm here really uh, just quoting this paper from Thomas Kirchhartz and Uwe Rau. Uh, which came out uh, recently, where they calculate the effect of this indirect band gap on solar cell performance. Because it could be good and bad, right? Because you slow down recombination, so you get plenty of time to extract your charge carriers, which is good for, for making an efficient solar cell. But on the other hand, because you have the indirect band gap just at the absorption edge, your absorption edge is less steep. And that means that your efficiency limit of your solar cell is reduced. Also, the radiative rate is lower, and that reduces the voltage of a solar cell. Um, so they've, they've uh, calculated the efficiency of potential solar cells. And what they find is that if you're limited by a low mobility in your semiconductor, then this, this indirect gap really helps. So, you know, for, for a small energy splitting of the two gaps, uh, you get a much lower efficiency than for a large splitting. If you're in the high mobility regime, then actually the one that doesn't have the splitting uh, has a higher efficiency. Now, the perovskites are up here. Right? So for perovskites, we actually wouldn't want the indirect band gap. And we actually want to understand it so then we can engineer it out of the perovskites. OK, so that uh, um, was my first part on the perovskites, uh, basically the, the more fundamental studies that we're doing in the perovskites. We now, just to give you an idea, we're trying to uh, understand where the splitting comes from so that we can actually uh, then engineer the materials such that they have no splitting uh, and, and become better solar cells. Now, of course, you could ask the question, do we actually need to make better solar cells from perovskites because they are already very efficient? And shouldn't we now focus on, uh, let's say, stability improvements and, and upscaling and all these things? So to answer that question, we do simulations on tandem solar cell performance. So this is this tandem solar cell that I showed before. Um, and it's made from, uh, let's say, um, or the, the most likely market entry for perovskites is this tandem cell from silicon solar cells and perovskite cells on top. And you could ask the question, how efficient does the perovskite cell have to be to, for this to make sense? And that's a particularly interesting question because these tandem cells depend heavily on on the conditions they're measured in. Right? So in the lab, we measure them always in the same conditions. They're all 25 degrees Celsius, a certain spectrum of the sunlight, and a certain intensity. But of course, in real life, you have very different weather conditions. So we set out to measure the, or to, to simulate the tandem performance in measured climate conditions in two different locations, Utrecht in the Netherlands and Denver in Colorado. Right? And from the pictures you've got, you can see that the weather's very different in the two places. In, in Utrecht, it always rains. And in Denver, you have about twice as much sunlight hours than in Utrecht. So, we took some two different locations and tried to simulate what is the tandem performance in these locations. So we built a model of a solar cell, which is in principle quite simple. You have a, a diode. You have non-radiative recombination and radiative recombination. You have a series resistance and a shunt resistance. And we take care of the fact that not, all, not every photon that comes into the solar cell leads to uh, charges. So then we just stack two of those together and we wire them up in different configurations and simulate them in realistic conditions. <coughs> 
for the silicon cell, we take the most efficient silicon cell um, that's ever been measured, so the record efficiency silicon cell, and we do the same for the perovskite cell. We take the record efficiency perovskite cell. Just a bit of a sanity check. So our simulation gives the same temperature coefficient as what we measure. Of course, it's more efficient because we simulate the, the record efficiency silicon cell. And also the intensity depends. So we here in this case, it's a perovskite cell. And we, we, we sort of uh, fit our model to the, the one sun uh, intensity. And then we simulate how it will perform at lower intensity and also compared to the measured data. That also works very well. So it, it seems to reproduce um, the, the effects that are actually going on in these solar cells um, at different intensities and different temperatures. So here's the, the result. So here I'm plotting the efficiency in these two different locations, Netherlands and Colorado, um, over, integrated over the entire year. Right? So the silicon cell on its own, in, in the lab you get something like 27%. In real life you would get about 24 to 25% efficiency. You lose a little bit because of the, these variations in, in environmental conditions. The surprising thing for us was if you put the perovskite cell on top, even if you take the most efficient perovskite cell that's ever been measured, the tandem efficiency is only ever so slightly increased over the silicon efficiency. So you don't actually win very much. And that's even the, the four terminal configuration. If you just wire them up in series, you actually lose by putting the perovskite cell on top. So that's, of course, a little bit disappointing to start with. But then we can go on and calculate how could you improve the perovskite cell. Um, we leave the silicon cell untouched. We only improve the perovskite cell. And how would that improve the overall tandem performance? And indeed, if you, if you reduce, for example, the contact losses, the non-radiative recombination losses, the resistances, and the optical losses, then you can go to very high efficiency uh, tandem solar cells. But the message is that we're not finished yet. Right? Perovskite cells have to become much, much better before these tandem cells uh, in real life do uh, uh, make real sense. All right, so to summarize the perovskite work, um, we, we have more and more evidence that this indirect band gap does exist, at least in the, the, the triiodide perovskite. Uh, we find that under pressure, we can turn into a direct band gap semiconductor. Um, and that we have to make much more efficient uh, perovskite solar cells. We're not finished yet. All right, now for a bit of a change of themes. So now I'm going to go to um, another way to increase solar cell efficiency. So before we had these two conveyor belts stacked on top of each other, we can also do a different scheme where we have two conveyor belts next to each other. So let's see how this works. Right? For low energy photons, uh, same as before, we just absorb a photon and excite an electron to the conduction band, and then extract the electron. Now the trick comes in when you look at high energy photons. Because then we, we absorb the um, photon, excite, uh, go to a very to a high lying excited state, and then we convert that excited state into two lower lying excited states. So that's a trick uh, or a process that actually happens in some organic semiconductors, and it's called uh, singlet fission. And with that process, we can make much better use of the high energy photons because you get twice as, ma twice as many electrons out per photon. So that raises the, the shock equalizer limit. This is the curve I showed you before. And the, the single fission raises the shock equalizer limit to about uh, 44%, depending on the configuration. OK, so how does this actually work? So in organic semiconductors, they're a bit different to inorganic semiconductors in the sense that they don't have uh, bands, not, not conduction and valence band, but they have uh, discrete states. Right? So they're made up by the molecular orbitals of the semiconductor uh, and their individual discrete states. And from the exclusion principle, we know that every state can only carry two electrons. And again, from the principle, we also know that they have to have opposite spin. Otherwise, they would be indistinguishable and wouldn't be allowed quantum mechanically. So the ground state in these molecules has to be a spin singlet state um, for it to work out. Now, if we excite a, uh, if an electron across the, the, the band gap, we generate an excited state. And in these uh, organic molecules, they're bound excited state. They're called excitons. And they're still going to be spin singlet states because the, the photon doesn't change the overall spin state of the system. So now to split it up, we have to put a second molecule in the ground state next to it. And then we, can, um, we have to find a state that's low enough in energy that we can uh, convert this one high energy state into two lower energy states. Now luckily in some molecules, the triplet exciton, which also exists, has an energy that's about half or less than half the energy of the singlet exciton. And if we if we have such a molecule, and these, these tetracenes are such molecules, then we can convert that one high energy singlet exciton into two low energy triplet exitons. And if you carefully count the number of spin down and spin up electrons before and after singlet fission, you'll find that it's the same. That's, of course, highly simplified, but it shows the, the message is that it's, it's allowed in energy and it's spin allowed. And for that reason, it can be fast and very efficient. So in, in pentacene, for example, the, the, uh, 
time scale is about 80 femtoseconds. So you can see these are the singlet excitons, these are the triplet excitons, and about, in about 80 femtoseconds, you have conversion from singlets to triplet excitons. So it's really fast. My favorite way to illustrate how fast it is is the time it takes light to pass through one red blood cell. It's a, it's a very fast process, and it's faster than anything else in these organic molecules, which means that it's 100% uh, efficient. So every photon will make you two triplet excitons. And then because they are they're triplets, they can't decay to the ground state by emitting a photon. That will be spin forbidden. So they hang around for a long time. And it depends on the quality of your material. And really high quality semiconductors can be microseconds. In our case, it's maybe tens or hundreds of nanoseconds. But it's, it's a very long time for such an excited state to hang around. So you have plenty of time for, in solar cells to extract these states. So um, I give you a very brief hint at some of the fundamental work we're doing, but it's not very far yet, so I sort of skim over this. But um, just to give you a flavor of, uh, because if you convert from one high energy exciton to two excitons, instead of two different molecules, at some point in this conversion, the molecules have to talk to each other. So the coupling of the molecules has to play an important role. So what we, we're looking at is, is um, how does the coupling uh, influence the single fission rate? And again, our way to do this is pressure. I showed you pressure measurements before. And pressure is a very nice and obvious way how to change coupling because you just bring the molecules closer together. You don't change very much about the chemistry or how the molecules are arranged. You just change the distance a little bit, and that increases the coupling. So here is a, an example of rubrine where we, uh, where we uh, look at the absorption spectrum, for example, and you can see it slightly redshifts under pressure. And the redshift is an indication of, of a stronger coupling because you stabilize the, the excited states in the molecule. And at the same time, we see an increase in single fission efficiency under, uh, at high pressure. So those are first indications of, uh, of this important role that coupling has to play for, uh, for, for this inefficient rate. And then we now try to quantify this a bit more um, and, and also to study systems that, are, that have other properties. OK, but now let's, let's go to solar cells again. So in solar cells, um, this could also be useful. And uh, as I showed you before, you could go from one singlet to two triplet excitons, so your photocurrent is doubled from the high energy photons. Right? On the other hand, your photovoltage, which is the, the potential you can extract, is halved at best, because every exciton is now half the energy of the original exciton. So the power, which is current times voltage, and which is the, the quantity you care about, isn't necessarily changed uh, by signal fission on its own. It's only increased if you have two semiconductors, one with a high band gap doing signal fission, and one with a low band gap uh, doing normal operation as a solar cell. Because then you have this one electron per photon at low energy, and then two electrons per photon at high energy scheme. And then you can win against a normal solar cell. So key is really to combine the fission material with a low band gap semiconductor. Our first attempts to do this was to choose quantum dots as the low band gap semiconductor because they're really tunable materials. So quantum dots, just by changing the size, you can change their band gap, you can change their emission uh, uh, wavelengths, so, um, and you can change their absorption uh, uh, wavelengths. So this is an example of, of quantum dots made from cadmium telluride. Uh, and they're all the same material, they're all the same solvent, the same ligands, and so on. Only the size is different. You can see the emission goes from, from infrared or near infrared all the way up to sort of green emission. And it's just the size that changes. And that's because the, the, the quantum dot physically confines the exciton. And just in a, a particle in the box, uh, quantum mechanical um, configuration, the smaller the box, the larger the energy, energy differences get. And that's also true for the band gap. OK, so the quantum dots are nice because you can tune the band gap exactly to the right band gap that you want for the single fission solar cells. So the idea was to make a, a solar cell very simple just from a transparent conductor. Then we put pentacene, the single fission material, on, uh, on, on the conductor. And then on top of that, we put the quantum dots and then simply put a top contact on, on the very top. So the, the blue light is then absorbed in pentacene, and the red light transmits through pentacene and absorbed by the quantum dots. Pentacene does singlet fission, generates two excitons, and then you can extract the charges from both the inefficient material and the quantum dots. Now, only very briefly, because it's already a long time ago, this, this sort of works. We can see current from the quantum dots and from the inefficient materials. Uh, back then, we got reasonable efficiencies uh, for, for quantum dot cells. Um, and so, in principle, this works. And we took this a little bit further, um, looking at a slightly different material, tips pentacene, and we tried to quantify how many electrons do we get out for every photon that tips pentacene absorbs. We do optical modeling to see how much uh, how many photons are absorbed in tips pentacene. We look at the, the quantum efficiency of the solar cell to see how many electrons coming out per photon at the wavelengths. And what we find is that uh, for every photon that is absorbed in tips pentacene, given the right quantum dot, we can abstract about one and a half electrons. So this really works. And this really is active 
in a solar cell, you can extract those electrons uh, quite efficiently. The problem is, of course, that quantum dots are not yet there to be a, a sort of mass product. So the real trick would be to get this to work on silicon. Right? If you could get just an add-on layer to a silicon solar cell, generate more current from the high-energy photons, then you're really in business and you could really do a, a, have, have impact on the solar cell market. So I think there are about four ways how this could be done. Uh, one is pretty much like a tandem cell, where you have a single fission cell and a silicon cell, and then you charge transfer inside the fission cell and then just wire them up in a, in a clever way and then extract the charges separately. Much more elegantly would be, uh, much more elegant uh, way to do this would be to have a single fission layer and a quantum dot layer, where you first transfer your exciton into the quantum dots and then emit a photon into silicon. Or you could also first go in the quantum dot and then do first the resonant energy transfer into silicon, which uh, would be more directed, or even direct what we call dexter transfer into silicon. Right? So, so it becomes successfully simpler architectures, but as I show you, this might be becoming successfully more difficult to implement. So let's look at the first one. This is basically like the tandem cell that we've we seen before. So he, there we saw the sort of uh, two-band gap configuration wired up in series. Now with single fission, uh, or, or let's say the problem here is that you have to match the current up to two subcells. Right? So because each electron travels to both semiconductors, uh, they have to have the same amount of current. Otherwise, it's limited by the lowest uh, number of uh, the lowest amount of current of the two subcells. And that's fine in the lab if you test the cells. But if, you, if the spectrum changes, um, then of course one of the cells absorbs more light than the other, and your current matching breaks down, and the overall efficiency goes down. Now with single fission, you can do a bit of a trick because your high band gap solar cell now splits the state into two lower energy states. So now you can have a, a cell that has a large band gap but a small voltage, and that you can voltage match with a low band gap cell. And then you connect it in, in parallel rather than in series. So you can do a parallel connection. So you only have to do voltage matching, which you can do by design. And then you don't have to worry about current matching anymore. So in this sense, we can put as many electrons as we want into the cables, if you like, and then uh, uh, don't need current matching. As a result, these cells should be much more stable against uh, spectral variations. And indeed, if we calculate the efficiency limit of these cells, you can see that the series tandem does decrease uh, when we have, uh, okay, we took diffuse light as a proxy for quite a blue spectrum. That's why usually diffuse light is quite blue. So under, under diffuse conditions, these tandem cells actually perform worse than a single junction cell. And uh, uh, for, the, for the parallel tandem, the single fission tandem, it really doesn't matter what spectrum you have, you always have the same efficiency. And that's because current matching is not required in these cells. So we made such a cell. We took a, a silicon cell. And on top of that, we put a, a cell inspired by, by Dan Congre from MIT where they they did this cell with pentacene. So pentacene is the active layer here. Very thin layer, only 50 nanometers, to be able to extract all the charges of the, of the cell. And then these are just extraction layers for electrons and holes on both sides. <coughs> and of course, we had to make two transparent contacts so the light could also pass, the low energy light could pass through the pentacene cell onto silicon. So what we find is the EQE spectrum, the external quantum efficiency. So it's the number of electrons coming out per photons that you shine onto your cell at a given photon energy. So you can see the silicon cell, this is basically the, the sort of silicon cell is, is flat pretty much, and it starts off at 95%, and then by putting our cell in front of it, it goes down to 40% because you absorb a lot of light in the contacts. You're not very good at making transparent contacts. However, uh, actually it drops down then more where the pentacene absorbs because pentacene also shades the light from the silicon cell. But if we do com connect the two cells, then we have a small bump in the EQE spectrum indicating that both cells, uh, you know, as you might expect, the current is just uh, summed up from the two cells. As I said, we are not very good at making transparent contacts, so we did a little trick to overcome this problem, to some extent at least, and that's this configuration where we shine light through the single fission cell, we bounce it off a mirror on the back, and then into the silicon cell again. That's, of course, a cheap trick that, you know, in reality wouldn't make any sense, but it's just to show uh, the potential of, the, of, of, of this kind of uh, uh, tandem cell. And if we do that, then we do slightly get above 100%. Right? So it's only very slightly, and it's only at a very, very narrow wavelength range. But basically what this says is that in these cells, you can extract more than one electron for every photon coming in. So in principle, this could work. It's still a big challenge, especially sort of the engineering of the device in the context and so on. But we could do simpler. Right? This was the device that showed you with two, two cells and then some, some cables in between. We could do away with the cables and put them on the outside of the cell and the single fission layer right on top of the silicon cell. That would be much nicer because it would be much more Simple, you only have to make one cell uh, and you add current from this inefficient layer on top of the silicon current. 
So I'll talk very briefly about uh, three different configurations, how to do this. Um, so you could take the tetracine layer, which is singlet fission, so you get your two triplet excitons. Then you can either put them in a quantum rod and, and transfer a photon or an energy into a silicon, or you could direct energy transfer into silicon. So let's start um, by, by, um, by looking at the, the first uh, part of it, the transfer of the quantum rod. Again, it's, it's fairly old work, so I'm not showing uh, all the details of it, but basically um, what we found uh, a couple of years ago is that if you have such a triplet exciton next to a quantum dot, it will transfer. Given the right quantum dot band gap, the triplet will always transfer into the quantum dot. And then it can then either charge separate into to electrons and holes, um, which we can see uh, spectroscopically, or you can emit a photon from the quantum dot. And that we can also see. So here's the emission from the quantum dots as a function of wavelengths, and this is the penicillin absorption in the back. So you can see where the penicillin absorbs more, the quantum dots also emit more photons, and if you quantify this, then, then the transfer efficiency comes out as above 95%. So every triplet exciton that, that sits in pentacene next to the quantum dot will transfer in the quantum dot. So that's kind of nice, because now you could just put a silicon cell there and, and absorb all those photons, and then you have a purely photonic down conversion from high energy photons into two low energy photons. And, and the nice thing is you don't need any physical contact between two cells. Um, but it's, it's a challenge, I think, because you also have other processes that you have to uh, get to work very efficiently. So for example, you have to be able to, to let the low band gap or low energy photons pass through your single fission layer without any loss. You have to absorb all the high energy photons. You have to get them all into the quantum dots. And then you have to emit all those excitations as photons. And you have to emit them all in the right direction. Right? You can also emit them to space. And then you have no, nothing. You don't win anything. So there's a lot of challenges. And we try to calculate what would be the efficiency gain if you solve all these challenges. So here are some uh, calculations where you look at the efficiency potential of such a solar cell um, given this is the band gap of the quantum dot, for example. So we found the uh, ideal band gap. And then we look at how all these losses. So for example, the transmission of the top layer for low band gap photons has to be very high, let's say above 90% or 95%. And the capture, and that's the, the efficiency of the whole process of, of absorbing, transferring the quantum dot, emission of the quantum dot, and an emission in the right direction. All that has to be let's say, above 80% for it to make any sense. So the product of all of these efficiencies has to be above 80%. It's a, it's a big challenge. I think it's not impossible. Uh, and you can get to very high efficiencies, let's say 30% or so, but it's, it's a large challenge. Um, just to give you an idea, 30% you know, doesn't sound so much uh, on top of, let's say, 26% starting silicon cell. So it's maybe a 4% gain, but it's, it's actually a big difference. In solar, uh, Every percent is really a big difference. So um, we spend about $2 billion on, on silicon solar cell research, and the efficiency only increases by 0.1%. So just to give you an idea how, how much uh, value there is in an efficiency increase of 1%. OK, so that, that was the, um, the part on the, the radiative transfer. And now we have two energy transfer schemes as well. So we can do either first resonant energy transfer into silicon or dexter transfer into silicon. And there's a difference between these two transfer processes. They're very well understood transfer processes um, and just a uh, uh, sort of quick recap, the first transfer is a dipole-dipole coupling of the donor and acceptor. So you, you have an excited state, and the dipole of that state couples to the dipole of the acceptor in the ground state, and thereby you transfer the energy from the donor to the acceptor. So it only works for states that are actually emissive, that can emit, emit a, a photon. Um, and that means it's, it's, it's very efficient for, for the singlet excitons, but it's, it's been forbidden for the triplet excitons. So for triplets, the dominating process is dexter transfer, where you have an electron from the excited side of the donor, which transfers in the excited side of the acceptor, and the ground side electron from the acceptor transfers into the donor. So you have a correlated two-electron transfer process at the interface, which is much shorter distance, because you have to have uh, electron wave function overlap for it to work. Um, but it's the only way triplets can transfer. And so for triplets, this is the dominating transfer process. So first, the trans oh, maybe just before I go into detail, these are, this is the only picture where, where Dexter and Furster ever met, uh, apparently in New York sometime in, in 1973 that they met. And they were quite different characters, but there, there was one occasion where the two met. And, and Dexter was actually very, uh, um, uh, was actually very forward looking. He actually had, had ideas that, that we're still working on. And one of them is this, uh, exactly the, the device that I'm showing you now. And this is his picture from 1979, where he has also got the single fission layer and then these triplets and they're transferred to silicon. So exactly the same as, as we were still working on, but he already had this idea in 1979. And in, in his paper, he writes that uh, so practical problems will doubtless have to be 
phased, but on the other hand, there's no need to accept the theoretical maximum efficiency prescribed for a given semiconductor in the solar spectrum. So that you can, you can take almost as our group motto. Right? So, uh, we're still uh, working on it. Okay, so let's look at first time dextra transfer into silicon. So first, let's look at the first transfer. So we know that this uh, transfer into um, the quantum dots works. So if we then somehow get the transfer into silicon work, then we would have a more efficient device. Now the problem with first transfer is that it depends on the uh, emission and absorption spectrum of the donor and acceptor, uh, and more, more on, the, on the overlap of those spectra. The problem is that silicon is ex an extremely bad absorber. And it's an indirect band gap, so the absorption coefficient of silicon is very, very low, especially near the band, band gap. So we'll, we ask the question, can you actually still transfer via first transfer into silicon? So here's our uh, model system, we, we took uh, tetracene, quantum dots, and then uh, a small spacer layer from silicon dioxide, uh, and the quantum dots also have ligands, and then we look at the transfer from quantum dots into silicon. And so far it's only theoretical work, we're now trying this in the lab as well, but uh, this is some, some calculations of the first rate and first efficiency uh, as a function of, of uh, various parameters. Uh, for example, the distance of the quantum dot to silicon. So how close do you have to be for first transfer to be efficient? What we find is that if you're two nanometers away, those are these, these curves, the transfer in the energy range we're interested in, which is the gray area, is very weak, maybe 10% or so. So it's, it's almost not worth doing. Whereas if you're one nanometer away, you can get transfer efficiencies of about 90% in the best cases. So the different colors indicate different photoluminescence quantum efficiencies of the quantum dots, where this is 20%, this is 90% or so. So you have to be within about one nanometer from the silicon surface to make this work. And that's, again, quite a challenge because they also have to passivate the silicon surface. You have to make sure it doesn't oxidize, and you have to somehow get the quantum dots attached uh, very closely. But it's not impossible. We, we, have, we are now working on um, attaching the quantum dots directly to silicon, and you know, it's, it's, uh, there's some progress, but not, uh, we're not finished yet. But it is a challenge, and maybe we can, we can have an easier time just getting away with quantum dots and putting silicon directly uh, next to the tetracene and then transferring uh, via dexter transfer into silicon. And of course, then we could uh, have, for example, a back contact with silicon cell where all the contacts are on the back and just extract those charges in silicon. And silicon is really efficient at extracting charges. Uh, basically, every exciton that is in silicon will end up as a charge in your circuit. So if we get this transfer to work, we're basically done. Um, so one way to, to probe this transfer, or at least have get indication of the transfer, is a, a thickness dependence lifetime measurement. So um, let's say you have a very thin layer of tetracene on silicon. If triplets transfer, they will all transfer because they all see the interface. If you go to a very thick layer, um, then only the triplets that will see the interface or those closer to the interface will transfer, and those are further away will not transfer. So for thicker layers, you expect a longer lifetime for those triplet excitons. That's a typical measurement to at least get indications of energy transfer. Now, Chris Bardeen and others have done this uh, in the past. This is, for example, a paper from Chris Bardeen's group where they look at fluorescence quenching of tetracene on silicon. It's exactly the experiment we're also looking at. And in the abstract, they already say, we find no evidence for triplet energy transfer to the silicon. That's, of course, disappointing, right? And, uh, and uh, um, uh, might put you off. And if you do the same experiment as they do, we also see no evidence of transfer into silicon. But then when we look a bit closer, what we find is that the tetracene grows in, in, in islands on the silicon surface of very different thickness. So if you do a bulk measurement of the whole surface, what you find is sort of a washed out uh, measurement of all the islands and all the different thicknesses. So you cannot distinguish between different, different thicknesses on the silicon surface. So we made maps of the lifetime. So we, we have a microscope, a lifetime microscope, where we can map uh, every island individually or the lifetime of every island individually. We then look at the same area of the device with the AFM to look at the height of the pictures. And then we extract the lifetime curve for every island uh, and we can, we can fit this, the fast and the slow decay. And uh, with our detail, the slow decay is basically the the lifetime of the triplet excitons. So if that is changed, we call it the delayed fluorescence, if that's changed at, at thicker islands, then we have indication of, of transfer of energy. It's only a necessary requirement. There's also, you know, we have to do an additional experiment to see if that really was transfer. But it's at least the first indication. And what we see is that for some surface treatments of silicon, so here we use uh, these molecules to passivate the silicon surface, we do in, indeed see a change in the delayed fluorescence. The prompt fluorescence is pretty constant, but the delayed fluorescence is is slightly increased. So that's the first indication, I would say, of that there could be some transfer given the right silicon surface treatment. So I hope that I could show you that uh, we have many ways how to use single fission on silicon, 
and that they, while they sort of become progressively simpler in architecture, it's progressively more difficult to actually realize uh, the, these uh, configurations. And with that, I'd like to thank my group, uh, in particular for this work, uh, Benjamin, Moritz, uh, Jamin, uh, and Tierney, and my collaborators, and all of you for listening. Thank you. Um, so the question is basically, what are the challenges of the, the perovskite silicon interface, right? Um, oh, I see, yeah. So the nice thing about perovskites is that they are uh, extremely insensitive to processing because all the trap sites that you could get are either close to the band edge or outside of the band. So they, it seems like whatever you do to them, they still form a nice semiconductor, which is uh, extremely nice. Um, although, that being said, it's not, not easy to get a nice film of perovskites. So there, there's many efforts. You know, the, the record efficiency for, for lab cells, and they're usually sub-square centimeters, or a few square millimeters, is 22%. The record efficiency for a cell that's, that's about this big is 13%. So it tells you that it's difficult to make a uniform, large area film. Um, but there's now a lot of effort going on in, in, in the more applied research institutes that, that try to make a sort of larger area perovskites. Uh, and then there's additional efforts, of course, to put it on silicon. Uh, the, the biggest one, I think, is that uh, all silicon cells are textured to just capture more light, because silicon, otherwise, is very reflective. So you texture them to make them rough to, to grab more light. Uh, and processing onto that is basically not possible. So you have to get a flat silicon cell. But you still want the, the light capture, right? So you have to do some clever light management to, to capture the light in silicon while still having a flat surface on silicon. You could texture the top, top perovskite uh, layer. But that's something that, that's still... Uh, I think a, a, a challenge. Right. This one? This one? The lifetime. This one. Okay. So you're asking what, what, what indicates transfer if your lifetime becomes faster or slower. So we have these two lifetimes. Always when we measure these inefficient materials, you get two lifetimes. One is fast and one is slow. And that's because you make first your high energy exciton, and that can directly decay and emit a photon. And then this is fast lifetime. Or you can first make these two triplet exotons, which can't decay by emitting a photon, but they can go back to a single exciton and then decay. So that's the delayed lifetime. And what we're looking for is a change in the delayed lifetime. So if the delayed lifetime gets faster, that means that these triplet exotons that have been here are somehow gone earlier before they emit a photon. And so they somehow have to be quenched. And that could be via transfer into silicon. So before they go back to the singlet and emit, they're transferred into silicon. And that's why the, the delayed lifetime gets faster. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the faster lifetime closes the interface. right? So here, you've got a faster lifetime if you see the interface. If you don't see the interface, you have a longer lifetime. That means that if they have seen the interface, they have transferred, maybe. Yeah. Still, you know, they could also be quenched by other mechanisms. There could be a trap or something, but there's at least some quenching going on. Yeah, yeah, so... We're looking into this, so it's a bit tricky because, uh, um, so what we're looking for is current in silicon, right? If it transfer into silicon, you should see that there's extra electrons in silicon. 
And that's, that's really the only good way of, of doing it. But in silicon, you have always got tons of charges because it absorbs all the other light that isn't absorbed in your, in your thin island. Um, so there's a strong background, but that's what we're working on right now. So we're doing, trying to do some, some time-resolved photoreflectance measurements where we can look at the charges in silicon uh, and see if, they, if, if charges sort of grow on the same time scale as these triplets um, transfer, then we have good indication that you know, those two processes are correlated and that we have a transfer right now. Um, so I think the first, first question was, is there something like the indirect direct band gap in polymers? Right? So I think the, the trick would be to have a bright state and just below that a dark state. And maybe the triplet state in polymers, you know, it's not so far away from the single state. So maybe could, you could say that's something like an indirect band gap, but it's not quite the same. Right? You really need this sort of band structure where you have two different spin states that have different uh, energy. Uh, and then you get uh, to, to the split in the conduction band. So I think the discrete state of, of, of polymers don't really allow easily, at least, for such a band structure. And then the second question was, I think, if you, um, was it that with polymer cells you are in this regime? Is that what you said, right? Yeah. So if you have some process to stabilize the excited states, you would win. And I think that's true. If you would be able to, um, to find a state that lives for longer without losing in, in mobility, right? So, uh, triplet states have much lower mobility, so there you wouldn't win. But if you have some state that's slightly low in energy, still has high mobility, same mobility as the high energy state, and just lives longer, then I think you could you could actually make a, a more efficient polymer cell. Mm -hmm. Time for one yes. more question. Uh, it's a very good question. I mean, we have uh, put this on hold. We actually have collaborations with Oxford PV um, uh, on, on these kind of things. But we have put this on hold because the, the um, low band gap perovskites were always quite inefficient or, and also quite unstable. That's the main thing. Right? To, to have a cell that's stable enough so you can do, you know, deposit the organics on top and then also measure all kinds of things, um, they have to be uh, pretty stable. Um, and they're still slightly too high in band gap. So 1.3 is on the edge, but you actually want something like 1.1. 1.2 at the maximum. In principle, that would be really nice because they're direct band gap, so they absorb light very strongly, so we do the whole first transfer much more efficiently. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, <laughs> to more efficient 1.1 EV perovskites that are also stable, then we would certainly do this. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.